The era of memorization is coming to an end. With you the bow in only one month, we gotta get ready, okay? And honestly, one month is nothing because that textbook that you need to read for usable is very, very thick. So you better have already started. But I have some more tips, so let's get it going. Hello, everybody. I'm Carr, and a couple of you guys wanted me to make some more usable videos. One of you guys asked me for a plant file video. Another person asked me for what you guys need to study for usable. The answer to the second one, you literally just have to study the book. Anything in the book is fair game, and if you read the book, you're automatically increasing your chances of getting questions right. Of course, there's things that are more important than others. But, if you just read the book, you're going to get those important things in addition to all the other obscure stuff. So, once again, reading the book is the most efficient way to get the knowledge you need for use the book. And today we're going to be talking about plant biology because no one cares more about anything other than their house plants. That's right, you don't even care about humans as much as house plants. I know for a fact that I love my plants more than my humans, you know what I'm saying? So anyways, what I'm going to cover in this video are the things that make up most of the questions on use the book that have to do with plants. This by no means is everything that you have to know about plants because there's a lot, lot more in the book that you gotta know. But I'll just give you a very basic, all the like big boy, big brain stuff. All right, first thing first, you gotta know basic plant phylogeny. So because this is kind of boring and because like I find it boring too, we're gonna wrap it, okay? Could I wrap it? I don't even know if I grab it. We're gonna, we're gonna try, okay? Let's see how it goes. A long time ago, a lovely green algae is called the Caravite transform. Oh, what the heck? Bro, this is hard. Dude, rapping is so hard, I give up. You know what? I'm just gonna tell it to you. Alright, let's try to make this interesting. So, a long time ago, as I was saying, a Caravite turned into a plant. And basically, it's the ancestor of the first plant. Alright, and basically, these first plants kept a couple characteristics of these Caravites. And the one important one is that they have sporopollenin which is basically the thing that covers their spores, or pollen in either case. Which makes sense, right? Spores, pollen, spore pollenin. Okay, that's pretty epic, but they also changed a lot of stuff too. So plants had something called alternation and generation. This is a pretty important thing to understand because it's asked basically every time, and it's basically very fundamental to plants, because all plants have it. All right, so let's start with the thick boy, big boy, normal boy plants that you see every single day, every time. Basically, those are called sporophytes. Now, these sporophytes are diploid, meaning they have two sets of each chromosome, okay? And this might not seem important, but it is. You gotta know whether or not it's diploid or haploid. And basically, when they're ready to reproduce, they produce spores, which are, in fact, haploid. Okay, confusing already. Sporophytes are diploid, spores are haploid. But the way you can remember this is like humans, we are diploid, right? But we produce gametes that are haploid, right? So when we gotta reproduce, we have to make haploid stuff. So these guys like spit out these nasty spores. Okay, maybe they're not nasty, but they're spores and they're haploid. So basically you get from diploid to haploid via meiosis. Now these spores, unfortunately, are not like human gametes. That's why they're literally not called gametes. Otherwise they would be called gametes if they're exactly like human stuff. So, they are called spores because they don't actually combine. They stay as haploid stuff and divide by mitosis to create a new plant. Okay, so it makes sense, right? Sporophytes are called sporophytes because they produce spores. So the next thing is going to be called gametophytes. And guess what they produce? They produce gametes. Very nice. So basically in a lot of the plants that we like to see, or like most of them are vascular plants, most of the gametophytes are pretty small relative to the sporophytes. And they're haploid because they basically take a spore and that divides by mitosis to make this new gametophyte. And then this gametophyte produces gametes which are exactly like human games. They basically are haploid and they combine to produce a zygote which eventually forms a sporophyte. So that's not too complicated. Sporophytes are diploid, they make spores which make gametophytes and make gametes which are like human gametes that also combine to form diploid stuff. So basically that's how it works. Now back to the story of how plants are different from their boring caraphyte ancestors. All right, so these are not necessarily as important, but it's good to know. So the first one is multicellular dependent embryo. Then there's wall spores because they have sporopollenin, epic. They have multicellular gametangia, which, which are not that important, but basically gametangia are the things that produce gametes. And lastly, apical mericens, which are important. They're basically the things that are on the tip of your shoot that causes the plant to grow. Makes sense, right? Apical means like the tip, and then meristem just means something that grows, like stem, grow, you know what I'm saying? Now, we took this like very ancestral plant and it evolved like Pikachu or Pokemon. Huh. I forgot how this works, I'm sorry. So basically, you start with the non-vascular plants, the bryophytes, and those are the first things, and the first thing they include are the liverwort. Those are also called hepatophyta. Then you also have mosses, which are called bryophyta, and then you have the hornwort, which are anthotherophyta. 
Okay, so those are all the non-vascular plants. All right, so basically what you have to know about these non-vascular plants is that they don't have vascular tissues, as you might suspect, because they're not called non-vascular plants. Wow, what a spoiler. And the other important thing is that instead of having the sporophytes being the big plant, you have the gametophytes are the big boy plant. So basically they have the big gametophytes and then the sporophyte is actually like within the gametophyte. So if a question asks you like, what is the dominant stage in a bryophyte life cycle? The answer is what? Yeah, that's right, gametophyte. You're not gonna get trolled and say sporophyte, right? All right, moving on. Now we've got past the non-vascular plants. Now you go to the seedless non-vascular plants. Or no, no, what? Now you go to seedless vascular plants. So basically the way to remember the progression is you start with non-vascular, then you go to vascular, but we're not that, just there yet. So you don't have seeds yet, so we're at seedless vascular. Now this is slightly less complicated because we only got two phylums in this point. We got the first, the lycophyte, and then we also got the manilophyte. So non-vascular is kind of easy to remember, right? You just got the warts and the mosses. What type of warts are there? Oh, there's a liver wart because you get a wart on your liver and then you also got the horn wart because warts look like horns, I don't know. But then mosses are quite clearly non-vascular so that should be easy to remember but seedless is a little bit more complicated. Like who the heck is supposed to know what lycophyte is? Like what? What does that even mean? So basically the two weird phylum are going to be in this class of plants, the seedless vascular plants. And basically they include a bunch of weird stuff that are not that important to know but here you go if you want it. Also knowing what's in it helps because it'll help you remember but yeah. This is what you got. All right, so if we have seedless vascular, there gotta be seed full vascular plants, and those are the gymnosperms and angiosperms. So basically, gymnosperms are the non-flowering plants, and angiosperms are the flowering plants. That's basically all you gotta know. Now, there's one more division you gotta know because just to troll us, the biology textbook divides angiosperms into two classes, and those two classes have some very specific differences that you gotta know. So, the two classes, monocots, dicots. Now, dicots have like eudicots and just normal dicots because dicot isn't like a specific class. Like, dicots is among several classes of plants, might be dicots, but monocots are like in between. So, eudicots is like a very specific subset of dicot. And that's the only one that's the actual phylogenetic clade. In terms of morphological stuff, we look at monocots and dicots and let's figure it out. So, the way I remember the difference is like mono means like one, right? And di means two. And Mono is less than two, so mono is just going to be a lot less, a lot more simple and just less complicated and less stuff overall. So of course they got one cot, so one cotyledon, which is basically your baby leaf, and then as you might expect, dicots have two. All right, monocots have parallel veins. Dicots are more complicated; they have more veins, so it's branch and network. Monocots are just like inferior in all ways, so they, instead of having like a ordered root system, they have an unorganized root system, so they have fibrous roots. So like when you pull a piece of grass out of the ground, it has like all the nasty stuff at the bottom, that's a monocot. And then dicots being the organized, cool, epic boy that they are, they have a tap root, which is basically a single root with a bunch of little roots branching off of it. And then monocots have one thing, one colon so they also have one pollen grain hole. Boop. Very nice, we got one pollen grain hole. Then one of dicots, okay, well, dicots gotta be troll, and instead of having two, of the holes on the pollen grain, they got three. Kind of like a bowling ball. And then another thing is the vascular system. Monocots have the inferior vascular system, so they have scattered stuff. Basically what that means is like all the xylem and phloem is scattered throughout the stem, not just in a certain ring, like dicots, because dicots are superior, so they have better organization. And then lastly, because dicots are just superior, their flowers also have more organs. So basically, your monophytes are gonna have multiple to three organs. However, your dicots, like the cool kids they are, have multiple to four or five varia. Alrighty, epic, we got past the dicots and the monocots. Those are the six differences that you guys gotta know. So basically the best way to remember it is just monocots have less stuff or they just have inferior stuff. Like branching veins, even though they're like less organized, they're just better. Like you spread it out to the whole leaf. Alrighty, epic, we made it through plant phylogeny. Epic. Now you don't really need to know that much of plant phylogeny for the usable, but it's pretty important that you just at least know the very base. The monocot and dicot uh, differentiation is pretty important though, so you can get some free points off that. Alrighty, thank you guys for watching. If you guys want more of these like usable crash course video kind of things, just let me know and I'll do it. I know I didn't cover even close to all of plant biology and there's more stuff I want to cover, it turned, I just wanted to make like a little bit shorter video so you guys don't get too bored and I'll make some more of these plant bio videos in the future. And don't worry, I'll get to the other point to bio later, okay? Chill. Okay, as always, if you enjoyed the video, leave a like and subscribe for more. Thank you guys for watching again and see you guys next time.